What's up, everyone? It's the OTP GM. This is the 37th episode of my Detroit Tigers GM Let's Play on Out of the Park Baseball 18. So we are here at the beginning of the 2024 season. This is going to be the 2023 off-season review and 2024 season preview episode. As I stated before, I'm condensing the entire off-season into one episode. It's easier for me to record and edit this way, and I think it just makes things a little bit more efficient. So let's get right into it with the beginning of the offseason. After our disappointing loss, we had some tough decisions that we had to make in regards to our team. But ultimately, uh, we did make some some solid decisions that I think will help us out. So first off, uh, we ended up getting our contract extended by our owner. Five years at $1.5 million per. So that was nice to see. And as stated before, Theo was not interested in, in coming back as our scouting director. Uh, he actually is the new general manager for the Miami Marlins, so got the position that he was looking for. Uh, but when we got into uh, salary arbitration, we, we re-signed most of the guys that were up for arbitration. We re-signed Kendall, Fiedo, uh Bueller, Minter, Steckenrider, and Santana. All of them got one-year deals to come back. Uh, we picked up Kella's option. Uh, he had that $4.6 million option. Uh, but we did. We had two guys that were on. Um, two guys that were up for arbitration that we did not resign. So the first one was Jimenez, and I'll get to why we didn't resign him in a minute. The second guy was Cody Eaves. So we ended up trading Cody Eaves to the Cincinnati Reds. We traded Cody Eaves in this young, uh, kind of middle. I mean, kind of young, eh, you know, starting pitcher, uh, Eaton. We got two solid pitchers in return. We got uh, this uh, Williams uh, Soto, and we got uh, Blaine Enlow in the deal. And um, so the reason that I decided to trade Eves, uh, part of it was is his, his, his contract has continued to go up, but his batting stats, he's really regressed over the last three years. So his peak season for us was 2020 when he hit 259, 49 home runs, 118 RBIs. And his numbers have really started to drop off since then. He's really started to struggle. All you know, A lot of numbers have started to come up. You can see his, his home runs are down. His RBIs were pretty good, but then he dropped down to 80 this past year. You know, strikeouts have been consistently high. He was never going to be a high batting average guy, but you can see his numbers have just started to really fall off for us recently. And I was a little bit concerned about just, you know, how expensive he was going to be in the regression that he was starting to show. And we have a lot of solid depth in our system when it comes to, uh, you know, infielders. Like we had made the trade for Jesse Barati, we had Dwayne Pippi, we had Santana, and there were a lot of really good um, free agents that were out there as well. And I, I, I just... I felt it was time to make a change, and that was why we ended up trading Eves and getting those two solid pitchers. And um, Soto is going to be a uh, he's going to be our fifth starter, and then Blaine Enlow is going to be in our bullpen. So I was I was really happy to get I thought it was a really solid trade to get these two guys and to bring them in. And then in regards to so that was what happened with arbitration, and then we let uh, Ian Kroll, Paxton uh, go to free agency. They they're Demands were much, much too high. We weren't. I think Pearl wanted like seven and a half million per, and Paxton wanted like fifteen million dollars. So we weren't going to pay them that much. In terms of the award season, it was a little light for us this year. Uh, we had Walker Bueller and Bryce Harper win Gold Gloves. Uh, Kella did win Reliever of the Year, uh, considering the year that he had. I'm not too surprised by how well he did. Uh, Kenley Jansen won it for the Dodgers, and then he promptly ended up going to the Rangers in the offseason. And then just a quick note here, I had this saved. We ended up uh, bringing this Craig uh, Graybeck in to be our new scouting director. He's one of the better guys up there, you know, uh, excellent for majors, outstanding for minors and amateurs, and good for uh, international scouting. So there weren't any guys that had tons of legendary stats, but I felt he was the best all-around scout, so that's why we brought uh, Graybeck in. Silver Sluggers, we only had one Silver Slugger, and that was Bryce Harper. Uh, we were shut out for the rest of all of the categories, which is a little disappointing, but considering some of the offensive here, some of our guys had not ultimately too surprising. 
Uh, Ronaldo Rivera did win Rookie of the Year. Uh, I was really happy to see that. I think, again, I thought he deserved an All-Star appearance, but uh, he definitely deserved to win uh, Rookie of the Year. He had a really great year um, with the numbers he put up, and I'm excited about his future. Uh, this Diego Mendia, Mendia, Medina, I totally butchered that. He wins uh, the Rookie of the Year in the NL. Uh, the New York Yankees manager, Matt Hopps, he won Manager of the Year. Uh, Travis Fryman won Manager of the Year in the National League. He was the Phillies manager. And then uh, Michael Fulmer lost the Cy Young this year to Darwin Ramos. I had mentioned earlier that there's going to be a lot of competition for Fulmer this year. And Ramos, I mean, he, he led the AL in strikeouts with 267. His ERA was slightly higher than Fulmer's, but he did have more wins. Uh, Fulmer had a slightly lower ERA at 3.19, but less strikeouts and less wins. So I can understand why they gave the award to Ramos. I, I, I wish you could see the voting numbers. I'm sure it would have been a close vote. But um, So second place for, for uh, Fulmer this year in the Cy Young. The NL uh, Cy Young went to Kyle Wright of the Cincinnati Reds. And then not much of a surprise here, Bryce Harper wins the uh, MVP. He nearly had a triple crown this year. And Dylan Cozens, I believe I called this uh, in one of the playoff episodes. Cozens uh, did win the uh, he did win the NL MVP award. Had a just another monstrous season for them. So Cozens was your MVP winner there. Now, when it comes to the Rule Five Draft, you guys know that I have one rule. If you've been watching my my series since the very beginning, I have one rule, and my rule is I don't draft anybody. If they haven't gotten, no matter how great the ratings are, I don't draft them if they're rating, if they don't get above high A, or you know if they don't have very much time above a low level of the minors. Well, I broke that rule this year for a couple reasons. I I ended up getting this Ronnie uh, Macario in the or Marcio Marcurio uh, Mar, Mar I think Marcio Marcio is how you pronounce that. We're just going to call him Ronnie. I'm just going to call him Ronnie so I stop butchering names. Ronnie was in the um, was in the Rule 5 draft, and his ratings were outstanding, and he, he hadn't played above high A except for a tiny stint. You can't see it right here. Uh, he played six games in the majors for the Phillies last year. So very, very brief time in the majors. Otherwise... He's only been high A. It's all he's ever been. So normally I wouldn't draft a guy like this, but because he's still trying to fill out some of his stats here. But I, I drafted him for two reasons. The first one, and I'm, I mean, the revenge factor is in this. He's in the, He was in the Phillies system, and I couldn't resist the chance to swipe one of their top guys. But the other part of it was drafting, after we traded Eves, drafting Ronnie gave us an opportunity to kind of shift our lineup around. It gives Santana a chance to move back to his natural position of second base, which is where he's better suited to play, than shortstop, which is what he's been playing pretty much his entire career with us. And then it gives uh, Barati a chance to kind of see if he can develop, because he didn't play very well in brief action for us last year, so it gives him a chance to see if he can develop. And then we still have Pippi's uh, versatility for us uh, in certain other positions. But I just, I like the idea of um of being able to move Santana back to his natural position of second base uh, with us getting rid of Eve. So that was the reasons behind this. This move might end up blowing up in my face. I've had other – and another thing, too, is his, he's a really great defender. He plays second and short. He's just an, an excellent defender and an excellent base dealer, two things that we really, really need. So this move could end up blowing up in my face. Some of my other Rule 5 picks have not worked out. Steckenrider has been one of the few um, picks that has been really good, but I've had other Rule 5 picks that have blown up in my face. So we'll see what happens with that this year. We're taking a chance, and we have to, we have to go with it. On to the Hall of Fame. Uh, Ichiro Suzuki was the only inductee this year. Uh, Beltran and Rodriguez fell just short in their first year of on the ballot. And then other newcomers, Joe Maurer and Sabathia, both got in the mid to upper 30s. And Adam Wainwright got over 20%. Uh, my votes, I voted for six players this year. 
I voted for Suzuki, Beltran, uh, Maurer, Rollins, uh, Tejada, and Hudson. Um, a couple of guys that I was close on, Rodriguez, I didn't vote for Rodriguez for a couple of reasons. One of them being that his numbers, while, I mean, he does have some some really good numbers in terms of, like, if you look at the, just the overall view of his career, you know, 483 saves, 2.95 ERA, the, the numbers look good, but the, the, the uh, threshold for closers is so much higher than a lot of other positions that I, I wanted to see what his voting totals were for the first year. And the fact that he's he's rated as being pretty close in some of the categories that matter for Hall of Fame metrics, uh, I think he eventually could get in on his own, but I was a little bit hesitant to vote for him. Sabathia was the other guy that I was close on, but ultimately I chose not to vote for Sabathia for two major reasons. One is his career ERA of 3.74 is a little bit high for my taste. Um, I don't think if you're approaching four for your career, you should be getting a Hall of Fame consideration. And the other part of it with Sebastia is while he did have some solid seasons uh, during his career, you know, he really tapered off here towards the end of his career, and it's just you know, it, for me, it just felt, uh, you know, with the ERA, some of the other statistics just aren't quite there. So, Sabathia is kind of a fence guy for me, but ultimately, I don't think I'm ever going to vote for him. Uh, but those are the two guys that I considered besides the six that I did vote for. Uh, we had one free agent signing this year, which was a left-handed reliever, Paco Rodriguez. We signed him to a three-year deal for $9.8 million. I wanted to get another lefty into the bullpen, and I liked Rodriguez's uh, ratings and the fact that uh, he's, his numbers, he wasn't asking for a lot of money. Like I said, there were a lot of really good free agents this offseason, but I couldn't bring myself to offer some of the contracts that these people were wanting. One of the guys that was a free agent was Lourdes Gurriel Jr., who's a perennial MVP candidate when he was with the Blue Jays. And I really thought about offering him a contract because we have so much money to play with. We have so much free. I mean, you can look at this. We have 70, over $70 million for free agents and over a hundred and eight, almost $120 million for extensions. But part of the reason why I didn't offer him a, a contract is part of it is his, his best uh, position is first base, which we already have locked down. But the other part of it is um, we need that money to be able to get extensions for some of these guys done. So Bryce Harper, I'll get to Bryce Harper in a second about why he doesn't have an extension yet. But if we're going to extend some of these guys, their prices are going to come up. And you've got guys coming into uh, arbitration soon. And I, I know Fiedo at some point is going to need a long-term deal. So it just, and, you know, and Bueller and Kendall. So I just, it, I didn't know if I wanted to add another massive, you know, $35, $40 million a year contract onto my books while I'm still trying to figure out what I'm going to do with the rest of the guys there. so, And then just another couple quick things before I get into the season preview. Uh, Kel Johnson, a former guy with our – he's in our minor league system. Uh, he signed with a team in uh, Japan, I believe. Or is this Korea? No, Korea. He signed in uh, Korea, so he's going to be playing over there next year. And then season expectations, uh, our owner wants us to win it all this year. And uh, then the top prospects list was published. So I want to get to the Bryce Harper extension thing uh, real quick before I get into the season preview. I had every, and before I give you guys the team and every that, everything like that, I had every intention of signing Bryce Harper to an extension this offseason. The problem is, Bryce Harper was looking for an eight-year deal at $44 million per, which is astronomical. And I didn't want to sign him to an eight-year deal because I don't want to be locked into the same situation like a lot of current teams are with bloated contracts for aging players like Miguel Cabrera with the Tigers and Pujols with the Angels and what Vado is going to be in a few years and Stanton's going to be down the road and you know, Cano down the road, all of these big, long, bloated contracts that are just going to be a, a just a suck hole on payroll for these teams later in their careers. 
So I went back and forth with Harper during the off season about five, six times. I tried to offer him five year deals, six year deals, tried to bring the money down a little bit, and he wouldn't sign. So what we're gonna do with Harper is we're gonna I'm gonna offer him an extension. I'm gonna continue to negotiate with him during the season. If he gets off to kind of a slow start, it might bring his price down slightly. I know it's kind of a cheap way to try to get an extension done, but uh, anything that we can do to try and help offset what the costs are going to be with signing him to an extension. So, but with that, uh, let's get into what the team is going to be this year and then what our preview is going to be uh, for this upcoming season. So, no big changes in terms of the lineup. Like I said, the only change is this uh, is Ronnie starting at shortstop. Everything else, and Santana moving to second, everything else is the same from last year. I didn't want to make any big sweeping changes. Like I said, I didn't want to have any knee-jerk overreactions to a couple of bad seasons that people had last year. We'll have to keep our eye on guys like Pentecost and some of these other guys. Uh, we do have a few injuries heading into the season. We lost Kristen Stewart to a fractured ankle. He's out. Brady Scott is out. And Corbin Martin continues to be out um, with the injury he suffered last year. But our lineup is pretty much, like I said, the only difference is we have uh, Barati in. He's going to be our um, Barra Roddy. Barra Reedy. Jesse. Again, we're just going to call him Jesse. Jesse is going to be kind of our backup second baseman uh, for now. And then we still got Pippi and everything. So that's the only major difference between between Ronnie and Jesse. There are two new additions. Pitching-wise, again, we have a few new additions here. Uh, we have William Soto as our fifth starter. And then we have uh, Paco Rodriguez and Enlo as our new bullpen pieces. Uh, Mark Ecker gets another chance to... See if he can stay up in the majors with Brady Scott being injured. Uh, but everything else is the same. Uh, Lakines in the start is going to start the year in the majors. So, so we got pretty much the core of our uh, bullpen intact. Our major guys are back, but then we're going to see if some of these new additions can help us. And then if we get into uh, so for spring training, we had a pretty good spring. Uh, we won 18 games, same as the Boston Red Sox and the Chicago Cubs. No big time standout spring training stats really for anybody, so nothing really to to get into there. Uh, we have a massive prediction this year. We are predicted for a hundred and ten wins, which is ridiculous. I don't know if I've ever seen. I mean, in all of my years of playing this game, I very rarely see teams with this bloated of a prediction. I mean, when I I mean I have a Houston Astros save, and they're I mean for a while there we were consistently being predicted for like. 115, 120 wins, but that was because I built that team into a monster. But with this, this is just crazy to see, you know, with a massive amount of runs scored and a super small ERA. So that's interesting to see that. And then they've got a Harper and Trout both uh, predicted for pretty nice seasons. And then it's nice to see multiple pitchers on here. Uh, Fulmer, Fajardo, and Bueller, both, uh, all three of them making the top pitchers list for this year. And then the Phillies predicted for 92 wins this year. The Cubs come in second at 99 wins for the league. So some guys to keep an eye on. But the Dodgers are the big surprise, way down in third now with only 82 wins. So we're going to have to keep an eye on them. Maybe their window has finally closed on them, and they won't be a big time. Maybe the Phillies will be our new uh, our new rival at this point. So those are the preseason predictions. And then we'll go ahead and we'll just head into we'll give you I'll give you guys the um the top prospects here. Again, I don't know I don't think we have a ton of top prospects again. I didn't have a chance to look through this. Uh this Ronnie is rated as a top prospect, but he'll lose that status pretty quickly since he's starting the season with us. And then um I don't know if we have any other top prospects. I don't oh, uh Blaine Enlow is also a top prospect. And this Stefan Pierce. I think he's a guy we recently drafted. So we have three top 100 prospects. So that's actually really good. We haven't had a lot of top prospects recently, so it's nice to see us kind of refilling our system, even if it's only temporary, because a couple of them are going to lose that. And then we got Jim Bland, uh, Juan Sanabria, Mike Carl, Josh Neiman, and John Wilkerson all in the top 200. This guy kind of dropped off the face of the planet. He was really high prospect before and he's really dropped down the rankings so but those are the top prospects and in terms of our own 
prospects in terms of our guys and everything. I'll finish up the episode with that. Um, I really, I really trimmed down our list here because we don't have a lot of guys either have kind of, um, you know, kind of, uh, leveled out or they're not really, there's no really need to keep them on this list anymore. So a couple of guys that are coming along that hopefully will be in the major soon. We got a couple of pitchers, Steve, uh, Degani, Deganji, and then Dan Franks. Uh, these are two guys that could make their debuts at some point, if not this season, definitely next year. Uh, Julio B. Rodriguez, a young outfielder starting to progress through our system. Uh, Blake Beers is another guy who hopefully will start to be making it up through the majors. He's kind of struggled recently, so we'll have to see uh, what happens with him. And then obviously Kel Johnson. I can actually remove Kel Johnson um, because he's not uh, he's not even with our team anymore. And then obviously Brady Scott. I'll probably remove Brady Scott from this list as well since he's going to be a, a fixture in the majors. So... Really not a lot of top prospects. Um, like I said, a lot of times I usually let the computer handle them for the first few years, and then I'll take care of it after that. So really not a whole lot to catch you guys up on in regards to that. I'll just do this real quick. There we go. But all right, with that, uh, that is our 2023 off-season review and 2024 season preview. I want to thank you guys for watching this episode. Feel free to like and subscribe. Comments and feedback are always welcome, and I'll be back at the end of the 2024 season for episode 38, 2024 season review.